us, Lord, for the rest of this time, Lord. We want to spend these next few minutes in your word. And Lord, I just, uh, I just think it's really special whenever, whenever the word of God is shared. I just feel like I know your Holy Spirit is with us, Lord. If we would, I pray, let everything go aside for now. Because there's really nothing else more important than listening for your Holy Spirit's voice. Speak to our minds, speak to our hearts, we pray. We give you our attention here, Lord, these next few minutes. And we thank you, Lord, for making this a holy place. Because your presence is here and your Holy Spirit speaks to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm excited to uh, start this uh, series with you. Uh, as you can see, it's called Old Testament Stories. Now, I don't want to lose you. Because some, for some reason, some people say all oh, the Old Testament. The Old Testament. And they think somehow the Old Testament, because it's got that word old in it, that it doesn't apply to us, or it's not relevant, or it's boring. But I got to say that uh, my prayer in these next five messages, that, uh, that you would really get, gain appreciation and even a love and a beauty of the Old Testament. We're always going to point the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we're going to point it, hopefully, prayerfully, to Jesus also. I want you to know also, I'm not, I haven't picked Old Testament stories that are familiar. I'm picking Old, Old Testament stories that are a little more obscure, so I'm not going to talk about David and Goliath. I'm not going to talk about Abraham. I'm not going to talk about Joseph. I'm going to talk about some other stories. Are you guys okay with that? And so we're going to, you know, one thing I, I, I really, really have a passion for is biblical literacy. I think sometimes our churches, we just assume that our people know and our people know the stories and they know the Bible. But we don't want to assume that anymore because of our assumptions have been wrong. So, so we're not going to assume that we know these stories and we're going to look at them and hopefully we're going to dive in and you're going to see the beauty of these Old Testament stories. But this, this book and this life that we're going to talk about today really caught my attention recently because... This life and this person is called the weeping prophet. And when I uh, heard this, I, 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 I quickly gained some interest. Because many of you know I've been in the ministry for 14 and a half years. And I tell you, I love the ministry. I love everything about it. I, 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 I don't think there could be anything else that I could have chosen or, 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 or done in my life. Really, God chose me. I didn't choose it. And, and at the same time, at the same time, just to be really transparent here, at the same time, there have been times in the ministry that I know what it's like to weep, that I've, I've had people that were very close to me lose their faith in God, totally give up on God. I've had uh, godly people, we've lost godly people through sickness and death and tragedy. Um, I've seen young people go to prison. I've seen young girls get pregnant. I, you name it, you name it, I've seen marriages break up. All these things, and it just, I, I know what it's like when I hear that term, weeping prophet. I know what that's like to have that kind of burden on the people. And so this person, many of you know this person already, this weeping prophet, his name is Jeremiah. By the way, Jeremiah also wrote the book of Lamentations. Does anyone know what that book is about? Lamentations, lamenting, weeping. So this, this prophet, Jeremiah, he's known to be the weeping prophet. But you know what really interests me about Jeremiah? If you go to the New Testament, Jesus talks to his disciples on Matthew chapter 16. I didn't put this up there, so if you want, you can, if you're a note taker, you can take this down. Matthew chapter 16, verse 14, in fact. Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And how do his disciples answer that? Matthew 16, verse 14. Do you guys remember? I actually had to go back and look at this. And when I saw it, I thought it was just really good because I knew the first answer that they gave him. They say, well, Jesus, some say that you're the prophet Elijah. But there's a second prophet that was mentioned that, is, that was just like Jesus. Who was that? It was the prophet Jeremiah. And when I saw that church, I said, man, that is special. Because we know a lot about the prophet Elijah. But I don't know if we really, really grasp how awesome Jeremiah is and how, how, how awesome his message is. So we're going to look at the prophet Jeremiah, the one who Jesus quotes, the one who, so, who Jesus even sounds like. That's the prophet Jeremiah. That's why they thought he was, uh, Jesus was Jeremiah. 
So let me tell you a little bit about Jeremiah. And turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, by the way. We're just going to really hit highlights in the book of Jeremiah. So turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, if you would, in your Bibles. Jeremiah lived at the time of the good King Josiah. In fact, the last good king before the nation separated. Jeremiah was a PK. You guys know what a PK is? Well, pastor's kid. But in this instance, he was a priest kid. He was a priest kid. And Jeremiah realized his calling, most scholars will say, around the time he was 16 to 18 years old, he realized his calling. Although, God made it clear in Jeremiah chapter 1 that God actually called him. God actually called him. God actually, uh, uh, at, uh, even before he was born, in his mother's womb, right? Jeremiah says in Jeremiah It says in Jeremiah chapter 1 that even before he was born, he was set apart, he was called. But Jeremiah didn't realize his calling until he was around 16 to 18 years old. I like what my favorite author says about this story. You can see the story, by the way, in Prophets and Kings, page 407. If you really want to see more detail about this story, Jeremiah, um, look at at what uh, she says in Prophets and Kings. Um, but I'll read, I'll read you at least this quote. Among those who had hoped for a permanent spiritual revival as a result of the Reformation under Josiah was Jeremiah. So, by the way, King Josiah's influence really, really touched Jeremiah. Called of God to the prophetic office while still a youth in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. A member of the Levitical priesthood, Jeremiah had been trained from childhood for holy service. I love that. We got to start our kids young. Amen. He was trained from childhood for a holy service. We got to put them up here. We got to get them working for the Lord. We got to start them young. In those happy years of preparation, he little realized that he had been ordained from birth to be a prophet unto the nations. And when the divine call came, he was overwhelmed with a sense of his, what church? Unworthiness. No, Lord, Lord, no, he explained. I am just a child. I'm just a kid. I'm too young. I'm too young. We, we, we can't ever think that God can't call young people. Amen? Because truly he's calling young people and he's working in their hearts to be there with him and to work with him. So I want to stop here real quick to make this point. Is there anyone here that's 16 to 18 years old? If you are, please raise your hand. We're going to get it. It's about four, five, six, seven, eight, 16 to 18 years old. I knew I was going to get like an uncle going like this. <laughs> okay, so we've got a seven, eight. We've got a seven or eight here. There are some people that are being shy right now. We have seven or eight people here. And, and I, I want to tell you guys, specifically you guys, who are 16 to 18 years old, that we're glad that you're here. Because we believe that God has a plan and purpose for your life. And I want to give you guys a challenge. That God is speaking to you. But in order for God to speak to you and for you to hear his voice, you got to listen. you got to listen. So around 16 to 18, Jeremiah receives his call. He's not going to be a priest like his daddy. He's called to be a prophet. By the way, I love that part. Because I don't think God calls the same person as our dad and as our mom. You are not the same person as daddy and mommy. You are different. You are special. God's called you. You're unique. Amen? We are different. We don't have to be like anybody else. Even our dad or even our mom. We don't have to be anybody else. You just have to be you. Amen? And so Jeremiah is called to be a prophet. And uh, let me tell you guys something. Because most of us don't really take the time to understand or think about what a prophet is. But I'll tell you, the prophet job is the worst job. Prophet's job is the worst, worst job. By the way, I thought about my worst job. It was actually my first job. For those of you who are 16 to 18 years old, I was 16 when I first had my, had my first job. You know what I used to do? I used to clean the toilets. I was the janitor at my school, and I used to clean toilets and clean bathrooms. And let me tell you, you know who was, you know who was dirtier? The guys or the girls' bathroom? No, actually, let me not say that. I used to clean toilets. I used to um, um, scrub the floors. I used to mop the floors. And at least, at least, I got $4.25 an hour. That was very sarcastic. But it wasn't the money. 
It wasn't about the money. I quickly learned that having a job was very good for me. I think I'm old school in that, guys. By the way, I think work is good. Young people, I think work is good. You know what um, my favorite author says? She says, the best way to pre- prevent the growth of evil is to preoccupy the soil. You know, it's the wor- you know what's the worst combination, I think, with young people? Idle hands. Idle hands and young people, that's a terrible combination. So get to work. You're old enough, get to work. Find something to do, right? At least you can weed out what you don't want to do. But get to work. Scrub toilets. Scrub dishes. Cook. Cut, um, um, cut vegetables. Do what you got to do, but, but don't have an idle, don't have idle hands. Don't have idle hands. You guys with me still? I didn't just lose you guys. Let me get back to the story. Being a prophet was the worst job. No one wanted it. You see, prophets were called to live differently. That's why people thought of them as weird. They were loners. They lived out in the wilderness. They ate crazy things like locusts. They were, they were like people that were like on the fringes. No one understood them. They were unpopular. Because the work of the prophet was to speak tough messages. Messages that the people did not want to hear most of the time. But that's the work of the prophet. The work of the prophet was to convey the message that God had for the people, even though that message may be tough. I tell you guys sometimes what the work of the pastor is, and actually, it's actually more of the work of the prophet. I tell you what a pastor does, right? Pastor comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. But that's actually what a prophet does. That second part is actually what a prophet does. uh, uh, What did I just say? (laughs) Afflicts the comfortable. Thank you. There's a little 40-year-old... Thing happening there in my brain. So the prophet was was unpopular, and and no one would have ever chosen to be a prophet, guys. No boy ever like was growing up thinking, oh yeah, one day I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a prophet. I'm gonna be unpopular, and I'm gonna be lonely, and I'm gonna be weird. They didn't choose that. The point is, God chose them. Prophets were chosen by God. So look at this description of Jeremiah's life real quick before we really get to some application. I really want you guys to see and know about Jeremiah. Prophets and Kings, page 420. So same book. Listen, listen to Jeremiah's life. Listen to his story. Cruel were the mockings he was called upon to endure. His sensitive soul was pierced through and through by the arrows of derision hurled at him by those who despised his messages and made light of his burden for their conversion. What did she just say? She just said that basically people made fun of him. People said awful things about him. He says, I was a derision to all my people, he declared, and their song all the day. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. Everyone mocks me. So as you can see, prophets had a tough job. But someone had to do it. God had to call up prophets whenever his people lost their way. Whenever his people, whenever, whenever his people lost their way and they were going in the wrong direction, God called the prophets, boom, call those people back. And the, and the, the prophets had to, had to send the message so the people can come back. By the way, do you think that God still calls prophets today? Let's make this very clear. Do you think that God still calls prophets today? Biblically, you better believe it. First Corinthians chapter 12, one of the spiritual gifts is the spiritual gift of prophets. And it says in first Corinthians 12 that those spiritual gifts will be in the church all the way until Jesus comes. So there are people, especially when the church is going like this, there are people who are going to be like the spokespeople and say, hey, guys, listen, we are going the wrong way. We got to get back on God's track. There's going to be people like that in the church today. Now, I want that to be very clear because sometimes in our church, we think of only one prophet. But the Bible says that there is a spiritual gift of prophets. There will be people that have that gift. Are you guys with me today? There's not just one voice or one person speaking this truth. God's calling people with that spiritual gift. I believe some of you guys have that spiritual gift. You may not know it. And you, of course, you wouldn't call yourself a prophet. It's not about calling yourself a prophet. It's not about having the title. It's about having that spiritual gift. Amen? You guys still, you guys awake today? You guys look tired today. You guys okay? We get a little deep today? We get a little deep today? 
You guys with me? Okay, stay with me. Stay with me. Come on. Uh, we, we, we're not going to go that long. Come on. So uh, 1 Corinthians 12, that's the, prof, the prophetic gift will be until Jesus comes. It's a tough job. But God calls Jeremiah, calls him, um, and, and, and he says this. He even gives him a warning. He says, do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Man, when I, when I read that, I said, man, what a unique way to say it. Don't be afraid of their faces. Now, if you ever want to understand that, you got you all go ahead and come up here someday during a church service at the 11 o'clock hour and during a sermon and look at y'all's faces. Some of you guys are downright scary. I, I, I think sometimes I'm looking at you guys and you guys are like, I'm hungry and I'm tired, so I'm hangry. Hurry up. You should look at your faces sometimes. So he says, don't be afraid of their faces. True prophets were not popular with the people because they did not bring a message that the people wanted to hear. Jeremiah was sent to his people because after the death of the last good king, King Josiah, the people lost their way. They went back to their old ways. That's what happens. Naturally, we gravitate towards what we used to do when we're left alone and when we don't have guidance we don't have vision this is what happens to people even god's people church what happens without guidance and without vision and without prophets what happens is that we go the wrong way so god's voice got has to be there with the people and he has to warn us and guess what guess what church those warnings those warnings We don't like to hear. We want to go our own way. That's our natural way. We want to go our own way. We don't want to hear, hey, it's time to change. But we got to hear it, even if we don't like it. Amen? Even if we don't like it, we need to listen to it. We need to hear it. And so Jeremiah, basically his his message was was clear, was, hey, guys, listen, it's it's time to repent. There is a time of trouble that's coming. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 30, he calls it a time of Jacob's trouble. And you guys are going to go through something really tough. And there's a tough time ahead. And so before this tough time comes, it is time to repent. It's time to get clear with God. It's time to, to have our sins forgiven. And this is his message. God tells Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I want you to go and I want you to tell this message. But, but God, they're not going to like it, and they're not going to like me. It doesn't matter, Jeremiah. I want you to give this message. I want you to give this message. And so Jeremiah goes. He goes to Jerusalem, and he sits out the side the temple gate, and he gives this message. Every single day, he sits out in the temple gate. And when people are passing to and fro, they're going in and out of the city, Jeremiah gives this message. Guys, it's time to wake up. It's time to repent. There's a time of trouble that's going to That's going to happen, and it's time to get right with God. That's his message, and he did it every single day. You guys know how long he he did it for? Every single day, faithfully preaching that message, the same message, for 41 years. 41 years, people did not hear what he was saying. 41 years, people just, like, tuned him out. 41 years, he was lonely. He was weeping. That's why he's called a weeping prophet. For 41 years, no one really listened to him, but yet he gave it. And he gave it. He gave that same message. Why? Because God called him to give that message. And he kept giving that message. And I hope that you guys are smelling what I'm cooking. The people weren't listening. They got tired. They even got annoyed. They even got so mad at him that they threatened to kill him. And they tried to kill him. You see, what was the problem? What, 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 why, was, why, did he, why did Jeremiah face so much animosity? It was because there were other prophets out there, false prophets, the Bible calls them. In Jeremiah, you can look this up. False prophets who were saying, hey, guys, there's nothing wrong. There is peace in every shore. Everything is good. Everything is good. And then Jeremiah is out here saying, guys, we got to repent. We got to change our ways. Something as big is about to happen, and we got to get ready. And then you got other prophets who are saying, no, no, no. Hey, everything's cool. Go about your business. No one has to change. Everything is good. So there was this total dichotomy of messages that people wanted to listen to. Guess which message? The pleasant one. So they didn't want to hear Jeremiah's message. They didn't want to hear reform. They didn't want to hear change. 
I love this quote. It says, if you want to be popular, preach happiness. If you want to be unpopular, preach holiness. What made him continue for 40 years? 40 years. 40 years of preaching this, getting discouraged, total discouragement, weeping all the time. What made him, what made him go on? And it's this right here. I love this text, Jeremiah 20, verse 9. You can write this down if you're a note taker. This is, this is what fueled him right here. And it says this, but his word, God's word, was in my heart like a burning fire. We talked about fire with Uncle Rufo's Sabbath school today. Burning fire and it was shut up in my bones and I couldn't, I couldn't get it out. I had to give this message. What made Jeremiah keep going, guys? It was that word of God that was in his heart. It was that passion for, for, for the word. And he kept going even though he didn't like it. And even though people didn't like him, he kept going because he was obedient to what God called him to do. He had to obey. He couldn't help it. It was too powerful in his heart and in his life. And look what Jeremiah went through just because he was obedient to God's call. Look what he went through. Jeremiah 16, he battled loneliness. He was a lonely man. In Jeremiah chapter 20, he was flogged or whipped, put in public stocks. In Jeremiah 26, he was put on trial for his life. And in Jeremiah 38, crazy story, he was put in a muddy cistern and he almost died in the mud. Just imagine Jeremiah as he's almost dying in this muddy pit. And he's saying, God, you called me to this? Like, you called me to do this work, and, and, and now this is what's happening to me? Like, you called me to this? I remember, I remember my friend, good friend of ours, who went to Chad, Africa, and contacted malaria and almost died there many times in one year. I remember a good friend of mine, from, uh, uh, friends of mine from Southern, a couple who also went to Chad, Africa, and they lost their two-month-old boy to malaria. Two-month-old boy, and I'm watching their video, and we're all watching it with tears, because as they're burying their little boy in this foreign land, as they're burying their little, son, their little baby, they're singing praises to God. Like, man, God, you called us to this? I could just imagine those people. I could just imagine Jeremiah saying, you called us to this? Church family, when you follow God's calling... I almost guarantee you it is not going to be easy. When you follow the call that God has placed on your heart, because, by the way, God has called all of you. God has commissioned all of you. And when you follow God's calling in your heart, you're going to face challenges. And it's not going to be easy. Do you guys know that? Last week, Pastor Kent Rufo asked us two questions, didn't he? You guys remember from last week? He asked us, who are you and why are you here? It's the same message in Jeremiah, Jeremiah's life. Who are you and why are you here? I want you guys to know, first of all, that God called you, each and every one of you. Are you guys listening to me right now? He called each and every one of you before you were born. While you were in your mother's womb, he called you. He knew that you had a plan and a purpose in your life. Do you guys believe that today? There was a plan and purpose in your life. God called you. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. Don't think this is just about some prophet a long time ago. We got to believe that that's for us. In fact, Jeremiah 29, verse 11 to 13. The girls read it today. I love it. For I know the plans I have for you. It's not talking about you, Glenn. It's talking about not you, Jeremiah. In fact, you can read this and replace the you with me as you read it. I know the plans I have for me, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. So even though Jeremiah's Warning was, hey guys, we got to shape up. There's a there's an army, there's a nation in the north that they're going to capture us, and they're going to take us prisoner. He still wanted to give them hope because guys, with God, no matter what we're going through, with God there is always hope. There's always going to be that hope when we're with God. So I want you to to notice something, church family. When God calls. When God calls you, 
We simply have to be obedient and leave the results to him. We got to leave the results to him. Amen. Because I want you to think about Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I just told you, he preaches for 41 years. He preaches the same message. Guess what? The Bible also says how many people he converted. How many people changed their way and changed their heart. You know how many people the Bible says, Jeremiah? We look at Jeremiah's life and you're like, why, why, why is Jeremiah compared to Jesus? Like, we look at Jeremiah's work and he's like, failed miserably. He's preaching for all this time. No one turns to God. In fact, later on, they're in captivity. No one turns to God. Oh, he's weeping. He's discouraged. No one turns to God. No one's baptized. Can you imagine someone preaching for 41 years and no one gets baptized? That to us is epic fail. We look at that and we're like, that was not successful. But in God's eyes, church, it was. We do our job and we are obedient. We leave the results to him. We leave the results to him. As long as we are being faithful to God, we leave the results to him. We don't worry about the results. We don't worry about the fruit. We just worry about being obedient. Amen? Man, I hope you guys wake up for me in the next few minutes because we're almost done. You guys wake up? Can we wake up? Church family, I believe God needs more Jeremiah's. God needs more Jeremiah's, people who are willing, people who are obedient, even if it's going to be tough to be obedient to him. God needs more Jeremiah's. I believe there's some people here that are hearing that. God's waking you up to be a Jeremiah, to be a more obedient, faithful, willing to suffer, willing to weep, and leave the results to God. You know, I believe in a very special way. That the Seventh-day Adventist Christian movement is placed at a time like this to be a voice like Jeremiah. Who else is warning people that there's a time of trouble coming and we got to be repent? We got to repent. We got to get ready. Who else is warning people that Jesus Christ is coming soon and we got to get ready? Who else is warning people? And I don't, I don't say that proudly. I say that humbly. I don't say that because we're better than anyone else. I say that because we have a job, just like Jeremiah. We have a job to do. We have a, we have a message to tell. Amen? Do you guys still believe that? So in Evangelism, page 199, I found this. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining... Wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import. The proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. That's us, man. That's our calling. And I believe God needs more Jeremiah's. God needs more weeping prophets. Like Noah was unpopular for declaring the end. Have you ever noticed that the Adventists have never really been that popular? Like, like Noah, our job is to tell people it's going to rain and remind people that I've already heard it. It's going to rain. Well, Glenn, you got to be more positive. I am positive. It's going to rain. It's not our message. That's the problem. It's the messengers. And I think I have discovered after 14 and a half years of ministry, I think I've discovered why. Like Jeremiah. The messengers have gotten discouraged. Man, if there was one thing I can, I can pick, up, pick out as, as what, what's going on in the church these days, I, I, I can really see it. I see it when I'm talking to people. I see it when we're in church worshiping. I see it. We're tired and we're discouraged. We're tired and we're discouraged. And so I want us to take heart, church, because in the book of Jeremiah, we also see what we can do about being discouraged. And so if you look at Jeremiah very closely, we can pick out some lessons. Lesson number one, know your calling. Know who you are and know why you're here. Know your calling and know that what's, what's, what's in between you and your calling is your comfort. And resist it, guys. Resist it. And then so simple, battle your discouragement. 
PDK actually prayed about that today many times. I don't know. I, I think he, I, it's, it's amazing because I was like, man, I'm going to preach about that today. Battle your discouragement. Man, if there's one thing, church, that we, that, that we have to recognize uh, uh, with us and, and, and the fire that, that, was, that was here or maybe is here or at once was here was that, man, people have gotten discouraged. It's discouraging to face hardship. It's discouraging when you're trying to give a message and people are rejecting it. It's discouraging when people don't like you or they don't like your message. It's discouraging and people are so discouraged. But I got to tell you, in Jeremiah, we also see what we can do against discouragement. And I love this. In Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 7, the first thing we can do against discouragement is to be honest. Did you know that God can handle it? If you are upset with God, did you know that God can handle it? You just tell him. You can tell him, God, why is this happening? Why am I going through this? Why are people around me suffering? Why? You, you can actually be honest with God. Amen? I'll try that again. You can actually be honest with God. Amen? You know how I know that? Because David was that. Psalms is like that. Psalms is written with total honesty. Jesus was honest in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Lord, I, I, if this is your will, I don't like it, but if this is your will. Jesus was honest with, the, with his father. We got to be honest. That's where it starts. You know what else? We found in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, we got to be obedient. If God calls you to something, God calls you to speak, or he calls you to be a nurse. He calls you to teach your kids. Whatever it is, be obedient. God calls you to be a prayerful person for your spouse. Be obedient. Be obedient. Even if it gets tough, be obedient. Jeremiah 20, verse 11. Be watchful. It says, I knew. Jeremiah said, I knew that God was with me. He was my, he was my companion. He knew it. He knew that God was with him so that he, didn't get, he wouldn't have to be discouraged. But this is right here, the last point. And how to battle your discouragement. And I think sometimes we know it, but we really don't know it. And that's this. Jeremiah 20, verse 13, and he says, in that text, he says, but I am going to go ahead and praise the Lord and sing to him. Be worshipful. If there's one thing, church, if there's one weapon that we have against discouragement, it is worship. And that's why even when we don't feel like worshiping, what do we ought to do? We got to worship. If there's one thing, if there's one weapon, if there's one thing that you take away from here and you're discouraged here today, one challenge I give you here today is worship. Spend time on your knees. Spend time in your text. Spend time speaking to God. Be honest with him. Pray to him. Listen to him. Worship, worship, worship. That is the greatest, the greatest weapon we have against discouragement. So I got to tell you, when Uncle was singing here, I was like, man, that's exactly what I was going to share here today. So this week was my wife's birthday. I won't say how old she turned. That's how we're, that's how we've been married for almost 12 years. So, so anyway, she had her birthday today and I took her to, on Kelly Gabriel's um, suggestion, I took her to downtown and we went on the river cruise and it was so cool. We learned so much about the architecture of, of Chicago and I tell you. Guys, it was pretty romantic, okay? I got to tell you. It was really, 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 it was, it was great. And we learned a lot about our city, about our new city. It was, it was amazing. So we, we learned a lot. We learned a lot of stories. And the last story that we were told, actually, was the story about the great Chicago fire. And it's funny because Uncle, before he sang, he actually told a little bit of that story. And so as you, as you have already heard, uh, this man, Horatio Spafford, Christian lawyer from Chicago. By the way, um, after I learned that this came out of Chicago, I thought that was even better. This story became even better. And whenever I've heard this story, I've always been moved. But Horatio Spafford, what, what Uncle didn't tell you is that Horatio Spafford was very good friends with a Dwight L. Moody. Have you guys heard of him? Moody Institute, and after the great Chicago fire, 
Um, even though Horatio Spafford lost so much, most of his things, as a Christian, he, he, he wasn't so concerned about his material stuff. He was more concerned about the people. And so Horatio Spafford and Dwight L. Moody, part of the story, took the time to really minister to the people that were homeless after that great Chicago fire and help the people who were, who were, who were uh, just really suffering at that time. And it is true. They set out to do an evangelistic meeting, Uncle Bing. And they went to, they were going to go to England. And because of business, it kept him back. And Horatio Spafford sent his family. What Uncle didn't tell you earlier is that, yes, he lost his family. He didn't lose his wife. His wife, after the crash, after that, uh, the ship crash, his, his wife held on to a piece of floating debris. But he lost his four daughters in the crash. Four daughters. Man, I know. I have four kids. I I just, I just identify with the story, and when he, and and when the, and when they took that, that ship, he took that ship, and he passed over those waters, like Uncle said, today. He took out a pen, and he wrote the words that I think, are so timeless, and they are classic, and they speak to us even now, 2018. When peace like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Know your calling. Battle your discouragement. Lessons from Jeremiah. And the best way to battle your discouragement is say, it is well. Worship. Where are the weeping prophets today, church? Where are the weeping prophets? Is that you today?